Buenos días. Buenos días. Let me see if I can get this right. Bienvenido yeah. al Carabino. Hoy es 5 de mayo. Welcome to Pilgrim. Today is May 5th. This is a place of extravagant welcome where we serve a still speaking God. So if you call God he or she or spirit, you are welcome here. If you are old in years but young in heart, you are welcome here. If you are old soul in a young body, you are welcome here. If you need a community to embrace your children, welcome. If you need to be forgiven or if you need to forgive someone else, welcome. This is the place where we reject racism, fight injustice, share earthly and spiritual resources. This is the place where you can bring your whole self and your culture. You are welcome here. Here we love old hymns, classical music, and gospel. We welcome those who are gay, straight, bisexual, transgender, or questioning. Here, we embrace diversity and love God. And we are so glad that you are here. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Carol Buscamante, and I am the liturgist slash historian. Today, many celebrate Cinco de Mayo, a victory in Puebla, Mexico, of 2,000 Mexican soldiers overcoming 6,000 French soldiers, soldiers in 1862. Also today, Muslims begin 30 days of fasting known as Ramadan to commemorate the first revelation of the Quran by the Islamic prophet Muhammad. And now, please allow me to begin the call to worship which is in your bulletin. Morning has broken. Let us give thanks for the gift of life and for the presence of the Holy One amongst us. Let us worship God together. Our opening hymn is Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Try 
right again. Please join me. Holy God, holy and mighty. Have mercy on us. Resurrected one, you have proven that nothing can defeat the power of your love. And yet we continue to nurture our doubts. Time and again, you demonstrate your ability to transform despair in our human story into miraculous hope in your divine purpose. Help us to remain faithful to your call and secure in your promises that life will triumph over death, that hope will triumph over despair, and that love will triumph over fear. God, call us again to follow you. Show us again the miracle of your love and abundance. Lead us again from the depths of our fear into the Easter life of your never-failing love. God of all nations, we come to you today on Cinco de Mayo as we celebrate this particular victory over superior forces. We pray for our own times of struggle against forces that are much bigger than our own strength and power. We thank you that with your help, we do not have to give up before the battle because we fear we are not strong enough. Holy One, we thank you that through the strength of our faith, we can anticipate victory in the battles and struggles we face. Amen. We are no longer strangers and sojourners, but now we ask these people to become equal citizens of this sacred community. They have prayed and have decided that we are to be their faith family. For that, we are a slant. Okay. All times and places of confessing our faith in the triune God. Do you people believe in God? I believe in God. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit. You may be seated. Do you promise to participate in the life and mission of this family of God's people, sharing regularly in the worship of God and enlisting in the work of this local church as it serves this community and world? If you agree, please say, I promise with the help of God. I promise with the help of God. At this time, I would ask our deacons to come forward. The deacons are considered the spiritual arm of the pastor of the church. I would ask them to be our At the end of service, our new members will be in the back, so as we exit and go into coffee hour, we will all have the opportunity to also greet them. Oh, there's no coffee So as you exit, you all have an opportunity. Let us pray. Oh, God. We praise you for calling us to faith and for gathering us into the church, the body of Christ. And we thank you for these three people gathered in this local church and we rejoice that you have increased our community of faith. Together may we live in the spirit, building one another up in love, sharing in the life and worship of the church and serving the world for the sake of Jesus Christ. Let us all say,
us today. Listen, God's word of hope is about to be spoken in this very room. Listen, open your ears, your eyes, and your hearts to hear the word of God. Today's reading is from Eugene Peterson's The Message. Scripture reading John 21, verses 1 through 19, pages 115, page 115 in your pew Bible. After this, Jesus appeared again to the disciples, this time at the Tiberias Sea, the Sea of Galilee. This is how he did it. Simon Peter, Thomas, nicknamed Twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the brother Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. Simon Peter announced, I'm going fishing. The rest of them replied, we're going with you. They went out and got in the boat. They caught nothing that night. When the sun came up, Jesus was standing on the beach, but they didn't recognize him. Jesus spoke to them, good morning. Did you catch anything for breakfast? They answered, no. He said, throw the net off the right side of the boat and see what happens. They did what he said. All of a sudden, there were so many fish in it, they weren't strong enough to pull it in. Then the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the master. When Simon Peter realized that it was the master, he threw on some clothes, for he was stripped for work, and dove into the sea. The other disciples came in by boat, for they weren't far from land, a hundred yards or so, pulling along the net full of fish. When they got out of the boat, they saw a fire laid, with fish and bread cooking on it. Jesus said, bring some of the fish you've just caught. Simon Peter joined them and pulled the net to shore, 153 big fish. And even with all of those fish, the net didn't rip. Jesus said, breakfast is ready. Not one of the disciples dared ask, who are you? They knew it was the master. Jesus then took the bread and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus had shown himself alive to the disciples since being raised from the dead. After breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Master, you know I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. He then asked a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Master, you know I love you. Jesus said, shepherd my sheep. Then he said it a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was upset that he asked for the third time, do you love me? So he answered, Master, you know everything there is to know. You've got to know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I'm telling you the very truth now. When you were young, you dressed yourself and went to wherever you wished. But when you get old, you'll have to stretch out your hands while someone else dresses you and takes you where you don't want to go. He said this to hint at the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God, and then he commanded, follow me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Life can break you into pieces. Life can kill all that you believe in. The disciples have been on an emotional roller coaster with the events of Good Friday and Easter. And I'm sure they were at the point of emotional exhaustion. So 
they returned to what they knew best, fishing. Their leader is gone. Their dreams of being on the right hand of Jesus, gone. They had left the life they knew their families, and for what? To become enemies of the state. To see their leader tortured and murdered. So it is in this melancholy that some of the disciples return to their former life in Galilee. You know, the, the place where wealthy people do not live. The place where people there struggle and always have a boot on their neck. A place where they were always thinking of ways to resist the empire. So they return to that place, to the bailing of hooks, to the casting of nets, to the very things that fed them before they were called, before they agreed to follow this holy man who went and got himself executed and put them on Rome's most wanted list. And Peter follows the disciples to where it all began, to where they had all become fishers of men. But Jesus is gone. I mean, that's enough to break anyone. The places that they walked were just now places of sadness and broken dreams. And that's enough to make anyone upset and afraid, dreams broken, cold and alone, sad and confused. So the disciples, they go back to square one. Because when awful things happen, and they will, but worse yet, when you let your own self down, and if you live long enough, you will, made me think, what, what would that feel like? And God spoke to me in this song. I can't sing well enough to sing it, but David Ruffin was the voice of an angel. And I was listening to the song, as I walked this land of broken dreams, I have visions of many things. That happiness is just an illusion filled with sadness and confusion. What becomes of the brokenhearted? Who has love that's now departed? I know I've got to find some peace of mind. Tell me, I can't stand this pain much longer. I walk the shadows searching for light, hoping and praying for someone to care always moving, going nowhere. I mean, it's true, sometimes life is more than we can deal with. And in those moments, we can become broken hearted. And in those moments, like the disciples, we want to retreat to be comfortable to what we once knew, to go back to our old haunts. It's easier to retreat to what we knew than to being challenged to push ahead and go forward. We like to look back instead of looking forward. So they go back to something that they knew, the familiar rhythm of being, but it's not working. Like nobody's catching anything. Things aren't as they were before. And so now, here on this lake, these people who made their living feeding themselves and others can't even catch enough to feed themselves. And a voice says, why don't you throw your nets on the other side of the boat? Okay, why not? And what they do, their nets fill with fish. And they, they realize that the one that's giving them advice is Jesus, the one directing them toward abundance when all 
all seems lost is Jesus. But here's where I say, wait a minute. What is Jesus doing there? I mean, if he's back on the scene, why isn't he in Rome giving Caesar a piece of his mind? Well, that's what I would do. But, but why isn't he in Jerusalem? <laughs> or why isn't he somewhere curing cancer or healing the blind or releasing some prisoners, making some crooked ways straight? Why didn't he go back and tell off Herod and Pilate, look at what you did? And, and why would Jesus pick that moment on, on, on a fishing boat to appear to them? I, I think Jesus is there at that very spot because that ordinary spot is exactly the places, the most profound places where we find God. And we've seen this over and over in scripture, like Jacob was in an ordinary spot using a stone for a pillow. And he wakes up to discover that he's at Bethel, the very house of God, or, or Moses tending his sheep on an ordinary mountain with a bush burst into flame. And he's standing barefoot before the great I am. Or, or this is my favorite one, when the spies dispatched by Joshua to scout out Jericho and dug into an ancient strip club, an ordinary space. They don't exactly expect to find God there, but the madam of the house, Rahab, ends up giving them a word from God. So Jesus is here in this ordinary spot where they're doing an ordinary thing, just fishing. This lets us know that the experience of the holy can occur in the most ordinary circumstances. On a fishing boat, at a stoplight, in the grocery store, even partying with your friends even when we're trying to escape the brokenness of our lives. God can just show up there. And when God intercepts our lives as Jesus did the lives of the disciples early that morning on the Sea of Galilee, it has a way of bringing us face to face with our calling. It has a way of bringing us face to face with our ultimate longing even in our grief and despair. So what is Jesus doing there? He's there because they are broken hearted. He is there because of their profound pain and guilt and shame. He is there to restore them. And ride or die Peter, well, he is so broken. Remember, right or die, Peter? From the last time we heard from him, he was in the high priest's court and he denied even knowing Jesus three times. So three times, Jesus asked him to confess, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? symbolically wiping away the three times that Peter had just denied him. Makes me think of the times I've said one thing and done another. It makes me think of the times I have not had the courage of my convictions. But here, Peter I mean, Jesus offers Peter and us a way back from that shame and grief and even some self-loathing. Because, to admit it, we all fall short of our goals and aspirations. We all have those moments 
when we give way to our worst fears. And we all are going to have times where we just don't follow through. And we all have times when we will disappoint the very people we love. But Jesus doesn't ask, why did you do it? Why did you fall short? Peter is asked this question, and Jesus asked us this question, do you love me? And Peter responds, yes. Do you love me? Yes. So I think that's why in this telling of this event in the Gospel of John, he gives us this recommissioning. Because it lets us know that Jesus, even in our brokenness and these hard moments when we've let people we love down, when we've let ourselves down, Jesus does not give up on us, not ever. Even when we are brokenhearted, even when we doubt our calling, instead, after each failure, we are invited to try again, and God is there with us, providing encouragement and nourishment. When, when Jesus says to him, okay, if you love me, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. Peter is given the gift of another opportunity to become what Jesus had always seen in him, what Jesus had always envisioned for him. It's not just that he was forgiven. It's that he's drawn back into being a disciple. He's drawn back into to the community. He's giving meaningful work to do. Feed my sheep. He's given grace. So, so this is why this is so important, because Peter's potential was not determined by his worst moment. When he was afraid, when he lied, when he turned his back. Peter's potential is not determined by his worst moment, just as your potential is not determined by your worst moment. The time you lied. That time you just went along to go along. The time that it was, you know, just a little bit too scary to stand up and tell people what you really believe in. That moment isn't the whole of who you are. Peter didn't know that. Peter didn't feel that, but God knew that. God knew that there was still time for Peter to become that fiery preacher of Pentecost. There was still time for Peter to confront the high priest, to confront the elders and the scribes as they assembled, to reach out to Cornelius, to be delivered from prison. There was still time for Peter. So now Peter knows that this journey that he had begun, it's not over. He didn't do something so bad he couldn't complete it. And so the power of this story for me is that each of us, along with Peter, have been given God's grace of another beginning, day by day, morning by morning, as it him says, new mercies, every day. And with it, the challenge to move forward. For there is still time for each of us to go and fulfill our calling. For us to be disciples. For us to use our gifts and skills for the glory of God. Because you know what? We too are commissioned to feed the sheep. So if you're feeling like the disciples and you're so down 
you can't even look up, put your net on the other side. And if the horror of this circumstance of living in this day and age seems to have killed and murdered everything you believe to be holy, Look closer. God is manifesting before your very eyes. Not in cathedrals, but in the ordinary secretness of your life. So if your soul is asking what becomes of the brokenhearted, who's had love that's now departed, Jesus is answering. They are called back into service. They become the wounded healers of this world. They become perfect in their imperfection. And the love and the peace will return to you in the most ordinary, unexpected places. Let it be so. Ashe. Your eyes. 
eyes open for God to appear in the most ordinary places and spaces of your lives. May the love of God surround you, the peace of God dwell in you, and the justice of God compel you. Go to 